just make it fun. The brain will shine some drinking wine. So me will dress like Frankenstein. Move up your waist, your body. Attention, just calling all antique collectors and treasure hunters. Thing. We are having a sale at Curious Goods. And it everything must go. Thing. A Friday the 13th podcast. Featuring your hosts and sales personnel, David Lawler and Bronwyn Knox. This week's special, Cupid's Arrow, includes an ugly statue of Cupid. Well, Adam McGoyan, take your pick. <laughs> wow, that's Sorry. messed up. I had to throw that in there because it's strange. I mean, look, film directors aren't known for their great looks, okay? And if you look at the statue in this thing, it kind of looks a little like Adam McGoyan. It makes you, makes you wonder if, if the production designer was like, you know what? I'm going to make a statue of that guy's kisser. Atom. They've done it before. I'm going to say his name is Atom Egoyan because it's A-T-O-M, you have to keep, not Adam. You have to keep Adam. doing that. No, this because is, you uh, keep Cupid's saying it. Quiver. People are going to think, would think his name was Adam. The third episode broadcast of the Sorry. popular television show by the 13th series. Uh, what was the air date on this sucker? We don't know, do we? It's like um, October. Sometime in October of 1987. Oh, there it is. October 5th. Right? Yes. No, that's not. No. Okay. That's the poison pen. No. Yeah, that's not even. Uh, forget about it. Anyway, Stephen Katz wrote this script, you as you can see. And Stephen it. Katz wrote several scripts. He wrote for L.A. Law, and he wrote for a couple of other shows. Adam Egoyan is a uh, filmmaker. Atom. He's gonna, she's <laughs> going to keep doing that, by the way. Um, <laughs> this guy just rub, rubs spit through his hair, which is not a great look for a guy looking for a lady out there. Um... What was I going to say about this? It was the first episode shot. Were you going to say that? Oh, right. Yeah. This is actually the first episode in the production order, um, which is kind of inexplicable, if you ask me, because why would they just go and shoot? Unless they did this as the sample that they were going to show to the Paramount executives. But the thing is, that's usually the pilot episode when you do that. So this starts out with this guy at a singles bar, just a bar bar, and he's striking out with uh, the ladies. Why does he approach someone that's already, already talking to another guy is a question. Well, because he, he understands that because he has that rather impossible, impractical, portable, quote-unquote, statue, <laughs> that he has power over people. Also, I'd like to point out that I believe this young lady was in... The David Cronenberg movie, The Fly. She plays the, the girl that Je Jeff Goldblum arm wrestles the other guy with, breaks his arm, and takes her home. Oh, okay. You can't I really did not see recognize it because it. she doesn't have the gaudy makeup on, and it is a rather dark yeah. bar. She said, she was yeah. like, do I look like a hooker to you? <laughs> that, was, that was her classic line. And then she says, I don't want to, I'm afraid. He says, like, don't be afraid. And then Gina Davis says, no, be afraid. Be very afraid. So back to what we're actually talking about. The guy has this keep his statue sitting on the bar, and it's enormous. It's like it's a, like 18 inches tall. This is kind of a problem here because he has to undo the burlap. Right? Is the bartender be okay with him just leaving this thing on the bar? Is a question I had. Also, yeah, you're you're right. They could have used like a pocket sized version. See, look, there's Adam going right there. Stop. Uh, the effect is interesting. I wonder how they did this. Did they do this with a computer or some kind of stop motion situation? Get a little animated Cupid when this he is a very good shot. Look at this shot bump. here. Not that shot. I'm talking about the wider shot. Very funny. <laughs> um, you can't really see it here, uh, but on television it looks fantastic. We're looking at this on my computer, which is a smaller screen. But if you look at it on TV, the, the lighting and the cinematography are outstanding because you have these, these incredible blues clashing with these reds, and then you have a spotlight on her. And I don't know if this was Adam Egoyne's influence. He's not... I don't think he's really primarily known as a kind of visualist in a way. I think he, he views himself as more of a storyteller. And that's maybe one of his failings for me. There are only two movies of his that I actually like. Because I remember him coming on to the scene in the early 90s with this movie called Exotica. With Mia Kirshner and a couple other people. And was that one of the ones that you liked? No. I watched it. I was expecting an erotic thriller, and it was just sort of like one of these explorations of souls and bondage, and it had this real indie sensibility about it. Um, so not the fun kind of bondage? Yeah, I suppose, <laughs> I, I guess. I mean, we The erotic thriller was really popular in the 90s, I think. It had its nadir, though, at the end of the century. Speaking of erotic thriller, these people are... Really getting it on. This is something I don't understand about this Cupid 
Um, because I said, and we, we had a little mini disagreement about this last night, I don't really think this thing gives you anything. It, it All it does is it puts a woman or whatever your subject is under a spell so that you can basically have your way with them, and then you have to murder them. And that, to me, does not really give you it doesn't give you any kind of like there's no incentive to use it well there is if you all you have to do is just get over yourself and stop being so lonely and then you won't have to murder anybody yeah i guess the idea is that you get laid i mean you get a woman's it should give you something a little bit longer than that that to me is not a commodity well i mean i mean maybe it's because i'm such a good looking magnetic person that i can have any (laughs) woman i want and i don't really need a cupid and this is how i look at things but when I was young and lonely, I did not wish for a device that enabled a woman to fall in love with me for me to have my way with her and then to ultimately kill her, like he's doing now. Yeah, well, to be fair, these are this is like a devil's uh, object here. I don't know, um... <laughs> and we don't really know how these people uh, come to figure out how to use this thing either. And then apparently he hears noises that sound like a woman's being strangled, but the thing is, look at this place. It's kind of a sleazy dive. I have a feeling you're going to be hearing a lot of women screaming. And then they bring in the cops almost like it was some kind of a, like, um, like a sting operation or something. They came in really quickly. There's that guy, Chris Hansen, that does that show where he, he, where he targets predators, sexual predators and pedophiles and all that stuff, and then he has them arrested or something immediately. Remember Chris Hansen, that show? I do they made, not. They made a South Park episode about it. Is it this a real, like a reality show or some kind of? It was like a crime show, show, like a real time crime show. Hmm. No, I don't know. Yes, you're right. They did come in really quickly. Like they were all sitting outside the door listening to him having sex, and then it, when it got ugly, they all jumped right in. So apparently, Mr. Egoyan said, uh, "At least two of these people smoke, so let's put smoke in this place to make it all smoky." Because I don't think we see this much. What are you talking about? <coughs> Curious goods. There's some smoke. What two characters smoke? I don't know, but there's enough characters in there to smoke to give us a smoke filter. Either a smoke filter or put fog in there. Either that or uh, maybe Mickey's burning a cake. Look at that, see? You're not seeing that? It's just atmosphere, you know? No, but they didn't go this far in later episodes. Let's do so our Roby hair watch. Hmm. I don't um, like it. I don't like it. I don't like her makeup. It's all completely wrong, and it's that and the smoke and her wardrobe seem to. That's the only indicators we have that this is probably the first episode that was shot. Uh, yeah, it looks like they made some um, badly advised attempt to straighten her hair. Not straighten like they used to straighten hair in the '90s, but like an '80s kind of straighten, which is that it's still very puffy. And they've taken also, all the curl out. It doesn't look good. Ah, let me finish. Go ahead. Well, that's it. Oh, but you keep cutting me off. Also, looks like they put like a fake beauty mark on her. Did they? Oh, I didn't notice that. So now we have to get our gaudy lamp together. Now they mentioned something about the cupid of Malik. And Malik was apparently such an ugly guy or something that he couldn't get a date. So he created this device or whatever, this object, and, uh, you know, caused uh, uh, a lot of people to suffer as a result of it. But So he couldn't get a date, so he made an, a device that he would always be able to get a date. But, I suppose. And is that, at that time, is that when, um, I think they say it in the dialogue, but I missed it, is that when it became cursed so that you had to kill someone, or did it just become cursed later on when... Um, Lewis That's what I wanted got, to know. That's is this did Lewis actually is this a cursed object or was it originally cursed? Yeah. But whatever it is, it's empowered now and um So here's some um, Actually it's Jack's fault. He mentions it earlier. He picked it up for Lewis on the continent somewhere. But on the continent. Mm-hmm. Um So Lorian and Mickey are on the crime scene and talking pretending to this cop. sort of pretending to be cops but um, not quite. This cop is a lot nicer to him than the one in the next episode. <laughs> no, he's not. He's a motel owner. Oh, well, he's um, dressed like a cop. What? Okay. The uh, She almost looks like she has a mullet. <laughs> Doesn't well, it's just that she's got her hair is pulled back at the top like in an Alice in Wonderland band. <laughs> but I like, I like her big... Uh, Ryan's hair is pulled back into a severe bun. <laughs> I like her big um, jacket, though. She's got one of those like high school yeah, varsity. jackets on. Varsity jackets. There's and here, a, this, is, this is Dennis Ordini. 
and we don't know, but this is Dennis Forrest. He was a regular on the show for four episodes at least. This is his first appearance. Uh, his next appearance will be in Brain Drain, I believe, and then the Mephisto Waltz. And then he takes the second season off, but then he returns late in the third season for the infamous My Wife Has a Dog episode. <laughs> He's a, a incredibly gifted. Um, and also, I mentioned before, he's kind of striking looking. He has a, a, a really great face. And then he would appear in the second season of World of Worlds with Catherine Disher, another favorite Canadian actress of mine. Absolutely loved her. She was on Forever Night. And she appeared in an episode of Friday the 13th. In two episodes of Friday the 13th, one is Ryan's girlfriend who is killed later on. Poor Ryan. And here come the cops, and I guess we're under arrest. Um, and then later on, she appears as a member of a witch's coven that puts a curse on Ryan. It's interesting how they kept going back to these actors, and maybe um, fans of the show didn't notice. Well, maybe they did, and now we're being they called the cops on us, so let's get the handcuffs. I don't know if I would have noticed. I mean, X-Files reused actors from time to time, maybe not as close. And he also appeared on an episode of X-Files. Proximity. <laughs> But even when I yeah, even when we watched it the first time, I didn't stop and think, "Hey, that's the same actor." Now he's her. This uh, character is harassing this girl. They're on a college campus, and he's pressuring another uh, his fellow co-ed here for a date. We should do a hair watch on this young lady. What She's, do you think of it? Uh, this was a very common style in the eighties. A lot of my friends had that in junior high, like the short curly bob. So here are Mickey and Ryan, and Ryan would fit in quite well. With the sunglasses? Yeah. <laughs> and he took them off dramatically. Hey, you were asking about that, about the taking off of the glasses dramatically. doesn't do it as well as, <coughs> as Jack does. Well, no, it's Shakespearean, that's why. I don't know, maybe Roby's hair's grown on me a little bit. She kind of looks like a high school student. Well, just because the girls you went to high school look like that. I don't know if she went, looks like a high school student. He's got a nice that's jean jacket on her. I had a jean jacket. Back home. This is also the era of the straight, tight skirts. It's very cute. And <laughs> there's Dennis fuming. Yeah, they stole, uh, they intervened in the situation and got the girl away from him. So, so now they're, this is a some kind of a frat that he isn't in, but he kind of works for them in the hope he's going to be let into it, I guess. I don't really know. He seems to be like a janitor or a handyman. Yeah, but they, you know, all the guys in the front know And they him. all look down their noses at him like he's, you know, a lesser being, like he's some kind of, because these, these, these are kids of privilege, you can tell later on. I guess you're supposed to assume that because they're in a frat, and the their frat house is all decorated for a Valentine's Day party. And oh, yes, and this. <laughs> yes, there's, there's this guy with this Harvard tie. They oh, like really he doing, went to Harvard. He's like a stereotype of a snooty college He's dude, Griffin yeah. Dunn. That's what I said. Gr he's Griffin like, Dunn less charming than Griffin Dunn. I like Griffin Dunn. I don't know if I like this guy. Uh, now, we had a question about this. He's how, got how the How does statue. he know that this thing can do what it does? He seems to instantly know. What are you doing? Maybe the because it's a cursed object, it just kind of gives you the suggestion. Um... I wanted to finish up on Dennis Forrest. Uh, mm. short I, I want to say shortly after he did, he did an episode of The X-Files in its ninth or tenth, in its ninth season. It's, yeah, maybe eighth or ninth season uh, where he played some kind of cult acolyte. But he was there, and he was having dinner with his friends in a restaurant, and he, he died of a heart attack in the middle of the restaurant. Oh, wow. And he was only, he was only like in his early 40s. If hmm. that, and it was just such a tragedy because he was such a young man. I wonder if he had some genetic problem or he had lived a little too hard. I don't even know. I can't even imagine. It's just a, it's just a shock. He played, he was in a couple of major movies. He was in Cliffhanger. He played, he played one of the henchmen, I think, one of them. Um, oh, who was the bad guy in mm, Cliffhanger? I don't remember him. I want to say John Lithgow. But he was in that. He was in a he was in a racer, I think, the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. So he was in some big movies. He had he had a lot. That was a bra hanging on that thing. Okay. They the frat boys they were partying. So this is the other guy in the frat with his. He kind of has like a Joe Piscopo body, and he's wearing a little hat. <laughs> What's so funny? I was just thinking about Joe Piscopo now. Oh uh, yeah. 
I have to mention the movie Dead Heat. It's a, one of the few things me and my daughter agree on. We both love that movie. Joe Piscopo, Treat Williams, may he rest in peace. Go check it out if you haven't. It's a really fun horror comedy. Anyway. Uh, we were going to, because we're trying to fill up as much dead air as possible this time, I wanted you to, to share the story of Cupid, because Cupid, you, you went off on this whole thing about Cupid, and you seem to know a lot about Cupid. Not necessarily. What I, I was just telling you the story of... Um, Cupid and Psyche. It's like when the Warner life. executives were asking about Superman with Kevin Smith because they talked about the kryptonite condom and they were like, boy, yeah. he seems to know a lot about Superman. So wait, here at first Mickey and Ryan are trying to um, get free Ryan, to search the frat house. but uh, they, they Ryan get, tries the angle again, but it doesn't work on this guy. The college student pretty much figures out pretty quickly they're not cops. He's like, you don't so, have a warrant, so get out of here. I'll have muffin so for yeah, you. So I yeah, I was just saying to you, do you know the story of Cupid and Psyche? And you didn't seem to know it. but Well, first you, you asked me if I knew the way the San Jose, and I was like, la, 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 la. <laughs> but go ahead. So Cupid, yes, was Aphrodite's son, as you probably know. And um, there was, was a... Babe. Uh, there's this human woman named Psyche, and she was, you know, she was a, came from a rich family. She had two sisters. Everyone in their town talked about how Psyche was so beautiful. Oh, my gosh, she's so beautiful. She's even more beautiful than Aphrodite. Even more beautiful than Roby. Aphrodite. So Aphrodite gets pissed, and she wants to do something to punish this girl. So Cupid agrees to try to help her out. He's going to try to shoot her with his arrow and make her fall in love with, you know, a monster or some stupid thing make a fool out of her. But when he sees her, she's so beautiful that he actually fails and somehow manages to shoot himself. He shot so now, himself? Now he's in love with Psyche. Um, but he can't just go out of his way and just marry her publicly because, well, first of all, it'll really piss off his mom. Mm -hmm. So he, they mar get married in some kind of sneaky Creepy ceremony. shrine over here, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> what's, the, what's Dennis Forrest's character's name? I don't know. Let's well, call anyway, him Rex. He's got a creepy shrine <laughs> to the co-ed that he likes. Um, so Cupid takes his new bride away. He, d he never lets Cupid, never, or Psyche never gets to see what he looks like. She, he takes her to some fancy mansion where she has everything she needs. She has luxuries and food and everything. He only visits her at night with the lights off. He comes to see her. They so it's kind of like room. They make love. Well, no, because she loves him. <laughs> he's too, holding her captive. I, I know it sounds charming and everything, but it sounds like he's really just holding her captive. Except that she likes it, apparently. So they make love, but then um, you make it that her you sisters want to, her sisters come to visit, and they're jealous because Psyche has all the jewels and all the luxuries, and she's really happy in love with her mysterious husband that she never sees. So they convince her, well, you should try to see this guy because what if he's a hideous monster? So finally they convince her to do that. So next time he comes to see her, after they do it, he falls asleep, and she uses a lamp to shine a light on him so she can see him. But a little drop of hot oil falls on him. He wakes up. Hot oil? Yeah. What kind of oil? I don't know. In the lamp. Are we talking canola, vegetable, or Whatever olive? they would have put in lamps in Greek times. Sapphire. I don't know. It's a myth. So Kerosene? <laughs> he, he wakes up, and he's really mad at her. Blah, blah, blah. You don't trust me. I'm not going to see you again. He takes off. So now Psyche's really upset because she she realizes that she's her husband was Cupid and she could have really scored there, but she f***ed it up. So, oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> I'm not to swear. I'm not supposed to swear. Don't worry, I'll bleep you. Uh, so she leaves and she's wandering the earth being really sad. She eventually ends up, um, after like doing a few things that please some other gods, she ends up, they end up, she ends up getting audience with Aphrodite who says, if you do these tasks... Oh, oh, there's Jack's... Oh, yeah, I forgot. Ah, sorry. My we got to throw this in here. Jack is not only an expert lockpick, forger, master of the occult, he's also really good at making uh, truth potions and putting them into college frat punch bowls. Well, he's acting as the bartender at the frat party here. Because he's a bartender, he has, too. Yeah, it's another one of his jobs, apparently. He, he knows how to attend bar. So he's here. Netflix, are you listening? Young Jack Marshak Chronicles. I get credit. Thank you. <laughs> So anyway, let me finish up the story. She, Aphrodite sends her some ridiculous tasks. I can't remember all of them. One of them involved sorting out like thousands of grains. Um, but an ant feels sorry for her and he helps her. So she surpasses that an task. An ant feels sorry know, right? for her. Or maybe it was a bunch of ants. And then another task. Come on, has, guys, let's help. She has to go see Persephone in the underworld and and survive going into the underworld to bring she some. She turned into a flower. I know that. To bring some of Persephone's beauty in a box back to Aphrodite. Whatever, she manages to um, 
do all the tasks except she messes up that last one. But Cupid rescues her, res- rescues Psyche, takes her to Zeus and said, enough is enough. This is my wife. I want to marry her. So Zeus is um, moved by his story of how he loves Psyche. Moved. And he gives, so he gives Psyche ambrosia, which makes her a god. And he bas- and Zeus basically tells Aphrodite, you have to back off. This is your well, husband's wife now. You can just turn now. somebody into a god with ambrosia? Apparently so. So that's the, the love story of of Cupid and Psyche, and, you know, this is why people don't get along with their mother-in-laws. Mother-in-law. Really? You think that's the origin? I'm just kidding. I always thought it was Jackie Gleason. But it is a story about not getting along with your mother-in-law. <laughs> All right. So, anyway, back at it. Well, um, Aphrodite, I mean, like, you talked about Grains of Stan, you talked about Aphrodite, and that all that goes into fairy tales, too, the whole thing with Aphrodite. She sounds like the wicked step, no, the uh, the wicked queen in uh, Snow White, right? Yeah, basically, because she's jealous of the of the younger and, um, and the grains of seeds or whatever you called them seeds. Grains, seeds, just a bunch of stuff she had to sort. Mm-hmm. See, the thing is, that's how you are. That's from what I've read in folklore. That's how you keep demons away from you is by putting like sand or seeds on the ground, and they're so anal they have to count every single one before they can get. I've them. heard that with vampires. Yeah, vampires as well. Yeah. So shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the actual show. Uh, here's Joe Piscopo in his hat again. <laughs> well, he's not in Men Talking. Without Hats. He was not going to be doing the safety dance anytime soon. So now Jack has used the truth serum on him, and he's quizzing him about the keep it statue. But I think at this point, Dennis Forrest has taken it to the uh, to a bar to pick up some action. Mm-hmm. This is kind of messed up. The whole thing is really, when I think about it, this is a very disturbing episode. It's not one of the great ones. This isn't one of the great episodes of the show, but it is very disturbing in the content because everyone has felt dejected. Everyone has felt lonely at some point in their life. Even the most popular people that you think you know, even this guy over here with the hat, even Griffin Dunn earlier, they've all at some point in their lives felt incredibly completely alone he really needs to make that tie a little bit longer because he looks like a real dork. (laughs) He looks like David Byrne on the dorkiest day of his life. Um, And uh, no matter what you do, you can't make people love you. And this really isn't about love. It's just about some kind of strange possession or being forced against your will. It's like a form of emotional rape. Sorry, I'm using the R word, but apparently according to YouTube, it's not dirty anymore. I mean, he's trying to get have control over someone. But he, I don't know what he's doing exactly because it seems like he wants the the other lady, you know, the young lady there, with the hair. Um, yeah, I guess so. But he just wants any kind of um, affection. But here comes Mister Egoy in there with his bow Stop. and uh, flink, right in the cheek too, and. Uh, it's interesting. Um, I think Egoyan was trying some of his filmmaker methods here. He puts a lot of things in red. He does a lot of close-ups of lips and eyes, as you can see. Um, I said it before. I, I, I think that Dennis Forrest is a very striking-looking young man here. He has a very interesting face. And he's a, he's a better actor than most of his generation, I would say. I, yeah, I suppose so. He's kind of like... Um he doesn't get enough credit for some of the because he he really creates an image you you don't forget about him. He's completely memorable. But he does <laughs> he does come off pretty creepy. You could see where the the female characters wouldn't be too interested in his character because he seems a little disturbed. So he looks a little bit like um, this is where he works. Of course, we saw this before in Mickey and Ryan a casing joint. Who does he look like? Um. <laughs> no, not necessarily it looks like him, but he reminds me a little bit of the actor from... Um, he has a little tiny refrigerator over there. Oh, he was in Lord of the Rings, and he was in Deadwood. Deadwood? Um, yeah, he played the Doctor in Deadwood. He was on. He played Warm Tongue in Lord of the Rings. I can't remember his name. Brad Dorff. Brad Dorff. Brad Dorff. How do you about? forget Brad Dorff? Yes, exactly. No, no, no. Brad Dorff. He has a definite door vibe there. And you know, no matter what, if you see his name in the credits, you know he's going to play somebody creepy. 
Yeah, well... He's not going to pay some guy with glasses being reasonable. Actually, that's exactly what he did play on Deadwood. The doctor was a guy no, wearing was, glasses and reasonable. I mean, Dennis Forrest. Oh, I've Dennis. never seen him play anybody unreasonable. Uh, reasonable. Okay. Brad Dorf, yeah, he's a fine actor. Um, all right, so now... I mean, his very first role, he gets nominated for an Oscar. And then it's all downhill from there, but he does become that's a respected right. character was, actor. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. He got an Oscar. Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't remember his name. It happens. Um, so here's Dennis Forrest strangling his date. Or no, did he strangle his date? No, I think in this is bees. Oh, that's right. And uh, if you check out Elise Wax's brilliant book, Curious Goods, the only real book that I know of that is actually about Friday the 13th series, yeah. Adam Egoyne has a story in there about bees. He said, I never worked with bees before. Yeah. I wouldn't really want to do that. Should probably talk a little bit about Mr. Egoyan's work. We did. I mentioned Exotica. He was. He made a movie called The Sweet Hereafter uh, with Ian Holm, who was nominated for an Oscar for that. And Sarah Pauly was also in that movie. So there is two connections to Friday Thirteenth, the series, as a result of that movie. And uh, he made a movie with. I want to say who was it? Colin Firth. It's Colin Firth and Kevin Bacon. He's worked with Colin Firth a couple of times, but he made a movie with Colin Firth, Kevin Bacon, Rachel Blanchard, and Alison Lohman called Where the Truth Lies. It was an okay movie. It was a fair movie. But my favorite movie of Egoyans, um was a movie called The Devil's Knot, with, also with Clive Owen and Reese Witherspoon, who I believe also produced or shepherded that project. And it was about the West Memphis uh, Three, the killers of, the alleged killers of these children in the Robin Hood Hills, and they made a a very good HBO documentary about it if you want to check it out called Paradise Lost. But then Egoyan makes this uh, movie about it too. And it's a little more stylized. And it's the reason I think I like it is that it's the most un egoyan like movie he made. That's the reason I like it. Every time I try to sit down and watch one of this cat's movies, I just give up. You know, it's just, it's just the way it is. He, he's like, he's like one of these, see, look, Look at how striking he looks in that picture. He's incredible. He's very he a photogenic. Very, he has a very intense face. Uh, I just, it's really hard to, to get into his movies because I, he's very, I don't know, what's the word? I don't know. I don't know. I don't. Like, he I mean, insists upon himself. Okay. How about that? He insists upon himself. I mean, he, um, <coughs> I, I can't say, I've seen a couple of his movies, but I can't say they made an impression on me one way or another. Did you see the giant honey bear that, uh, Dennis Forrest, you were telling your story about Adam McGowan. I didn't want to interrupt. He had this enormous honey bear that he's using to attract the bees. I thought that was kind of funny. What do you mean it's a honey bear? Isn't it, it's one of those bears, I think, that you put the honey in, but it's a big one. But, yeah, here he goes. Well, see, now, I mean, the thing about this is I just don't understand the reward aspect of this. I mean, like, a you, moment's you passion isn't worth this. No, no, you get the reward first, and then you pay the bill by killing the girl. I guess I don't. Or I don't maybe know. the girl was already killed, and then you use that death to power it. Because that's the way the show usually is. You have to power something with death, or with blood, or something along those lines. You know, it's the it's the yeah, murder itself, the way. act that that gives the cursed object its charge, if you will. But it seems like the Cupid is changing them because he has no look at he's like mocking her. And the, um, it just seems like it, the, the guy who's using the Cupid has no um, feeling, no remorse for what he's doing. And probably before they started using this Cupid, they were probably a relatively normal human being that cared Apparently about Apparently they're people. watching Stop Making Sense in the background there. No, that um. looks like some 60s, <coughs> it's like some 60s model. I don't, I don't know what they're watching there. But do you know what I'm saying? Like the, mm-hmm. the guy has no remorse. So I think the Cupid kind of affects their, their brain a little bit. All right. I'm waiting for weird, more weird sounds outside the window. <laughs> I keep hearing all kinds of stuff. It's fantastic. Uh, so this is what they stole out of his room. They're always uh, breaking and entering, these guys. Hey, the fridge stopped. <laughs> more noise. <laughs> hey, you wanted to record in the kitchen. Oh, yeah, we're recording in the kitchen tonight. I want to take a minute to... Uh, to praise uh, Brahman's art, it's absolutely incredible, the artwork that she has done for these three episodes. And this next one, I think, is a, it's a big heart, right? It's a big heart. It's a big heart. And it's got an I Love Lucy in it that says uh, Cupid's Quiver, hopefully, once we get it done. We do the artwork around the time we, we record the episode. He's got a couple of welts on his face, I guess. From the bees. Yes. 
Are there any more notes there, or do we have to wing it now? <laughs> I think we're, we're on the point where we're winging it, actually. There were things that um, have passed, like they mentioned apparently at some point, they mentioned Mickey's engagement. We've passed that moment of dialogue. Um, Jack's truth potion was an old Scottish potion. Scottish! Um, if it's not Scottish, it's crap! Sorry. Then there's something here I can't read. You're right, I sometimes It says three garbage right. men <laughs> in a tenement. <laughs> Three garbage men in a tenement? So the, oh, this is Jack. He, this, Wasn't that he a movie with somebody. Tom Selleck and Ted Hansen? Jack found somebody to try to help him find uh, Dennis Young and where he went with the uh, the young lady outside of the bar. <laughs> Jack Marshak, The Bartender Chronicles. Read it on. <laughs> he really likes smoke. Have you noticed there's smoke in every room in these interiors? I believe there would be smoke at a frat party in the eighties. It's not like um, what happened later when yeah, you're but not you allowed to smoke, smoke, smoke anywhere. You don't see any, you don't any, see anybody smoking. Nobody's smoking. You know, it's kind of like that '70s show. You know how in that '70s show in the basement they had smoke everywhere, but you never saw anybody smoking in well, the little table like, shots. They don't. You know what happened? They don't want to. They didn't want to show it. I don't know. Does Canada was, was Canada really strict? Anybody listening, write in about their experiences <laughs> in Canada. Are they really strict about smoking? I know they were in the UK. But, I mean, um, this was filmed in the 80s, so I'm sure whatever happened has yeah, but changed. It's late mm-hmm. 80s, though. The late 80s, the late 80s began 80s. the new era of the Age of Reason. The late 80s are completely different from the early 80s. Very much <laughs> so. The early 80s are still. You still smoke cigarettes on The Tonight Show, and you had a three martini lunch and a one joint coffee break. Uh oh. Jack found a dead body. Pops. <laughs> he calls him Pops. So Did you say Bowser? He did. He called him Bowser, Bowser like, as in John Bowser Bauman from Sean and I. Dip, 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 dip. He's making friends. Now here's the girl, um, the co-ed that, that she is cute. Dennis I Forrest give her liked. That. She she's, is, she's cute. She kind of reminds me of somebody. I don't know who. She's got another date. Maybe the actress Rebecca Schaefer, the one who was um, killed by her obsessive stock, stalking fan. She looks a little bit Speaking like of stalking, it comes... I know. This is, Here it comes creeping up behind her. This is, it's interesting. The we didn't is, hear as much about stalking at this time, but then the next year and the year after and into the 90s, we started hearing about obsessive stalkers. If you liked her, though, if you, why would you want to use this on her? Because he knows he's going to have to kill her. He's got like a, a, he knows her, he's known her for a long time. It's like more longstanding. So why would he? I don't know. You know how you, you were just telling me earlier that I'm controlling, that I tend to want to control things around me, right? Yeah, but that's... Um, it might be a, a male thing if you want to think about it that way, if you want to go split this up by the genders. No, because females can be controlling too. I just don't... This seems kind of a waste. It's like, well, you spent all this time having this crush and you're imagining some kind of a romantic thing with this girl. You're being and then, practical about it, though. This well, is, yeah, I'm, obviously... My perspective is this is the male ego personified. <laughs> Men do want to control because they're worried that the thing that they love will will run away from them, them you know. Well, admittedly, killing someone will keep them from running away from you. Um, uh, sleeping with the enemy, I remember that. It's not that was really... a popular movie in the early 90s. Patrick Bergen is, uh, you know, a violent husband. And he says to her, I can't live without you, and I'm not going to let you live without me. You know. Yeah, this just doesn't seem to be very, very good um, long-term planning, is all I'm saying. He totally hit him with a pipe. You know, poor Dennis gets Ow. <laughs> he gets knocked around quite a bit, even though he is a murderer, and he kind of deserves it, but there you go. Here's Mickey left to um, try to reason with his girl who's been zapped by the Cupid. Well, they don't know that yet. And we're, n- we're not supposed to know that either. She has already been zapped, um, so she goes along with, and then... You know. Oh, we didn't see But they know. I think they know, because they they set up a sting. Jack's about to double over here. <laughs> He's been running around in the forest of, <coughs> forest of New Orleans. This is New Orleans, they call it. New Orleans, okay? New Orleans. Or NOLA. NOLA is short for New Orleans. Mickey's always left to like soothe the women and children that are uh, Meanwhile, the, the victims of these things. This, hmm? this jerk, this idiot, is going to take this thing away from them. 
Oh, the security guard from the, the university? Yeah. Yeah, and if you notice, I believe, I mentioned this before, but he was the chief of police in Atlantic City in the Jersey Devil episode of X-Files. He's the one who locks up Mulder out of spite in the drunk tank. You know, and he, I guess, locks horns with him because he doesn't like the FBI snooping around. All right, it's pretty amazing that you remember this guy. I know faces. I know some faces, anyway. You know the majority of them. Remember that idea you were going to come up with? It was that guy thing. You you were going to do a thing. Unfortunately, I think somebody else has already done it. A yeah. website where they match up like character actors. It was the mighty similar. big. Yeah. Some people from Mighty Big TV. They were the ones who came yeah. up with the that guy thing. Um. Okay. So this is one of those things where they think that they have the cursed object back, and then it nope. It's they still need to work a little harder to get it locked up. And it's like a fake out, false ending. Not they quite. take this young lady back to Curious Goods, and um, basically, the luckily she lures them in. Uh, she, they lure her into a trap. <laughs> he, he looks so completely normal, he really doesn't he? Does. <laughs> <laughs> Need the extra credit. <laughs> Security guard's like, sure, I'll give you the statue. <laughs> he kind of reminds me a little bit of Peter Lore. You know the actor. Yeah. The one who would always talks like this. You know, he would sound like Rand from Ran and Stampy. Actually, it kind of looks like Rand. He's like sneering at this guy. He's showing his teeth and stuff. He should really brush his teeth, get a shower and a shave, comb his hair, put on some clean clothes. Do something about the bee stings on his face, perhaps? I don't know. He could probably do a lot. As I said, he's not unattractive. There's something, there's something charismatic about him, even though he is a perv. Isn't that weird? Not where he's creepy yet charismatic. All right. I don't can know you think of that. any other actors who are creepy yet charismatic? You can say Kevin Spacey. You're allowed to. You can say John Malkovich. I guess if you wanted to. Yeah. Well, you tell me. There's women that like liked those actors. Yeah. So yeah. My mother. So, yeah. Your mother. Okay. No, your mother. <laughs> no, your mother. Your mother. Uh, some mm, there are there are young men who can be creepy and charismatic. So, oh, that guy. Who's that guy? Uh, the guy, the guy, the guy who abducts David in Six Feet Under. That actor with the creepy eyes. Oh, I don't. And know he was that. on House too. Michael Weston. I didn't, yeah. Okay. Michael Weston. He who also he also played Bobby Boussoulet in the remake of Helter Skelter. So obviously they were thinking he was charismatic yet creepy at the same time. I mean, you're kind of hoping all actors are. Charismatic in some way, but you don't want all of them to be creepy. You <laughs> no, only want exactly. a certain portion of them to be <laughs> creepy. Not gonna be creepy. What are we? We were just watching something a couple days ago. Oh, Ray Liotta in Ray Liotta. Wi- something wild. He's yes. Oh, God. very creepy. And that's and I the guess... music I'm using for this episode is from that. I was I, I got inspired by that. He I, he's a little more creepy than he is charismatic though, because especially <laughs> okay. in that movie, so there's a creepy to char- charismatic um, ratio that you're trying to balance here. <laughs> No, I was just thinking about something wild. I was thinking there was something wrong with the movie, and what was wrong about that movie were the two leads, Jeff Daniels and Melanie Griffith, because okay. it's a New York movie, and they, the two of them do not look like New York people. That was a big problem. Ray Liotta mm. does, but he's not even a New York person in the movie. The movie would have worked so much better with two leads that were more New York-oriented. Apparently, the spell he has over her still works on the phone because she just called him. Yes, and they're it's like, I I'm think, going to escape my rescuers. I think they were, they were gambling on that because here I didn't we go. get that impression. Is, I thought it was just random. this is undercover Mickey here. She's got a wig on, and I don't know how she found an incredible wig to match that that young lady's hair. Neither do I. There's all kinds of things apparently at Curious Goods that we don't know about. Oh, I found out today. Oh, well, maybe last night. Was it last night? That uh, Roby, before she became a singer and before, like, when she was a model, you, you saw her on the cover of romance novels. They oh. put her as the girl on the romance novels back in the early 80s. Ooh, that's interesting. Usually, cause, probably because of the hair and everything. I don't probably, know. Probably. They yeah. put her with Fabio or some shit. Sorry, <laughs> Can you excuse imagine? me. <laughs> well, sure, she's very pretty and she has that, uh, that super flowing hair. She has classic looks, too, actually. That's the thing. We're talking about her backside right now because we can't see her. And you're not supposed to know that that's Roby. But, yeah, she is there pretending to be that person. I wish I had her name. <laughs> she does mm. a fine job here, i got to say, though. The performance. Who, Roby? Yeah. She does a, she, she, there's something very genuine about her. I don't know why. She's not really like a classically trained actress, if you will. 
Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, I There's guess. There's something real about her. Yeah, she's. I guess she's just a natural. Some people are. I don't know. Like we mentioned before, the poison pen when the when the spider was crawling on her arm and she can barely scream, Brian. It yeah, just, it, it felt so real to me. Maybe they put a real spider on her. That would. Oh that no, it was a real spider. Actually. We know that. <laughs> doing but. some acting there. She she she's got this great bug eyed reality about her. <laughs> even he's saying he doesn't want to kill her. The slick back hair is not a good idea. He he's looks like, even more creepy. He's the bad guy that, you know, combined with the statue, but you still feel kind of bad for him. Mm. So he doesn't really understand anything about she, social oh, skills. Hmm? This is really good too. I really like this because this, to me, is what this is all about. Is when she gets hit with the thing, she feels compelled. It's. See, yes, now she loves him because she's been shot by But the she doesn't look like effect. she really loves him, though. She looks like she's being forced to love him, you know? Yeah, it kind of reminds me of um, Jessica Jessica Jones. What oh, was that Lord. show? Oh, yes, yes, I know what you're talking about. David Tennant's David character. David Tennant and Jessica Jones. Forcing people. He's a pusher. He would, yeah, you know? yeah, he was a pusher. He was forcing, he forced Jessica Jones and all these... Uh, he would force these women to be his girlfriends. God knows. I mean, like, which is kind of, hey, little, are you going to come in here and ruin our day now? Yeah. Um, well, we're coming to the end, so why not? Uh, so, I already said before, this is not one of my favorite episodes, but there are some interesting bits visually about it, probably because of Adam Egoyan. Uh I should mention also, Adam Egoyan is a Canadian filmmaker, but he uh, has combination of Lebanese Armenian ancestry. Hmm. So he's Lebanese Armenian and Canadian. Uh, That's interesting. They're having a chase scene on the pipes. I just want to point that out. Oh. It would have been much oh. better if he, he had been impaled by the arrow, by the tip of the arrow. That would have been cooler to see. But I don't know. Is it really big enough to do much damage? I think this is okay. Though. And look at his shirt. There's an arrow. Well, yeah, that's there. the... the, the um, logo of the frat though that's their mascot if you will so what do you think about the wig no i'm glad that uh, that's not her usual hair doesn't really look that good so what did you think of this episode um it's you know this is where the episodes are generally starting to get better but they haven't really quite fully mastered it yet they haven't really gotten to the point where Like, the action and the storylines are okay, but they haven't gotten to the point where the emotions of the characters have not gotten very interesting yet. All right. Are we all set, Little? I was saying all that <laughs> while the cat is loudly using the litter box, so that's pretty fun. This is so amazing. We had a toilet flush ruin our first take of the first episode. Oh, we heard this. We did hear this in the previous episode. Oh, yeah? Okay. <laughs> so they always have this little... Conversation about how horrible people Epilogue, are. Epilogue, yeah. Just wrapping things up. Are they in, in the, vault, the vault Is this yeah, the vault? Yeah, they're in the vault. Now he's back in the vault. And I'm sorry, but I think you should have, number one, closed circuit camera inside the vault at all times. And number two, always have somebody on the outside of the vault just in case you get stuck in there. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're going to go in, you should probably make sure to have a, someone spotting you, as you will, if you will. Do they have closed, cam- uh, closed circuit TVs in the 80s? Yeah, they probably of course did. they did. Yeah. yeah. I can't remember. It's all a big blur. Uh, now Ryan's trying to ask. I can't out believe the he's trying to mac on her after I, everything after she's been that. through. It's fantastic. And she has a. Oh, great! She has Doctor Teeth over here. <laughs> she has a dream date. Hey, baby, want to go out for a date? Ah, uh, he got With the old kiss on the cheek. Boy, yeah. The old brush off. Seriously, oh like he can't believe he's considering using the arrow. Back to big hair again. And then he asks his own cousin out. That's that's totally normal. Oh wait, sorry, cousin by marriage. Kissing cousins. <laughs> Kissing. Uh, well, you didn't try. Jack. <laughs> that's a weird freeze frame. It is. What do you guys think of my police squad uh, freeze frames there? Bronwyn hates them. 
Uh, well, thanks for listening. Story consultant Rob Hedden. I noticed his name in the credits. Uh, Thanks for listening. <laughs> Our next episode we'll will be time. what? Cup of Time, time. starring Hilary Shepard and little Lisa Jacob. And, uh, <laughs> Facebook, former Facebook friend, I should say. Anyway, um, there's a bunch of songs here. Uh, I guess this is Canadian rock. Anyway, good night. <laughs> say good night. Good night. <laughs>